Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Mark Bishop. I'm Vice President of Policy and Communications at the Healthy Schools Campaign, and we are excited that you're all able to take the time and join us today. We've got a great, uh, first of all, we've got a great um, audience. We had a lot of interest in this webinar, and you got a lot of school nurses, and school nursing is something that is very close and dear to the heart of the Healthy Schools Campaign. Um, today's webinar is called A School Nurse in Every School Addressing Barriers to Adequate Funding for School Nursing. Um, before we go get into a little bit of the specifics, I'd like to go over some logistics and some background. Um, first of all, uh, we are doing a series. Uh, we are doing a series of webinars. We're coming up on the end of them. We've got two more left, so if you're interested in learning more about school food, on April 16th, we have quite innovations for healthy school food, where we have some uh, three school districts talking about some of the unheralded improvements that they've been making and how these can improve school food, but also be, make improvements in, in your school. Uh, and on May 1st, we have the small business side of improving school food, where we're going to be highlighting vendors and how local businesses can actually benefit. Um, real quick, there's a quick question. Um, Alex, is there a way to mute the phone if you are? Is, is there a way? Anyway, so let's, let's keep continuing. I'm sorry. So next, logistics. The um, webinar is going to uh, run for approximately an hour. Uh, there will also be a recording of this webinar as well as the slides that will be on our website within the next day is our goal. So you will get an email with the information to, uh, to be able to access the archives with the slides. So please do not worry about taking too many notes because you will have access uh, finally, there will be a survey when you exit. Please take two minutes to complete it. It's very short, and your feedback is really important to us in how we develop our, our um, webinars and information in the future. Um, finally, we will, at the end of the session, we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, it will be held in the final 15 minutes or so. Uh, there, and if you would like to ask a question, we're not doing it through the phone today. We're going to be asking questions through the questions box. So you can type in your question at any point during the webinar, and we will get to them during the end. We will sort through them and make sure that we're you know, not duplicating, but we want to make sure we get your questions answered to the best of our ability. So don't be shy. So now let's get started. So Healthy Schools Campaign. Um, a little bit about Healthy Schools Campaign. We are a not-for-profit organization. We're located in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we work on programs and policies that address the school health uh, food and fitness and environment uh, in schools. School nursing is something that has been very close and dear to our heart. As, our, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we began working with school nurses close to the beginning of the Healthy Schools campaign around 10 years ago when we developed leadership training for school nurses and developed training programs in Illinois and in Chicago and have since expanded those trainings into other states as well, most recently in Kentucky, Colorado, and New York. So and, because we believe that school nursing is really integral to improving health of our students and increasing access and increasing the ability for school nurses to take leadership within their own schools. So all of our work has really led us to what where we're currently working on um, with our Health in Mind effort. And our Health in Mind is a recent um, project for us. It's been a collaborative effort with more than 50 organizations participating with the goal of developing recommendations to the Department of Ed and the, the U.S. Department of Ed and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to better integrate health and education policy and to make sure that we understand to be, a success, to be successful with our education system, we have to make sure we're addressing the health needs of our students. We, our, our report is broken into four, category, four areas, and the first one is our recommendations around school nursing. Uh, and making sure we are increasing access to school health services for our students. Second would be professional development and looking at strategies to incorporate health and wellness into school um, uh, school teacher, school uh, teacher, administrator, principal training, and making sure that they understand um, how important health is to educational outcomes. The third is research recognition and accountability, because we want to make sure that we are incorporating all the best research and um, ability to incent doing the right thing in terms of health. And finally, parental involvement and making sure parents have a strong voice in making sure our kids and our students are healthy. Our report, while our, our project, while not ending in May, is going to be culminating or is, is going to be crescendoing in May 
on May 9th when we are going to be releasing a report uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, with a report to the Department of Ed and Health and Human Services with um, Secretaries Duncan and Sebelius. That's going to happen on May 9th, and we're excited to have all the involvement of everyone who's interested and really kick that off. Um, so that brings us to today's speaker, because we're going to be focusing a lot on the school nurse portion of our health and mind work today, uh, and I'm excited to get this started. Our speakers, uh, we have four of them. Uh, first, we have Donna Mezek at the National Association of School Nurses, Melinda Landau at San Jose School District, Denise Baldwin Hopkins County School District, and my colleague Alice Scheibel here at Healthy Schools Campaign. And together, we are going to be we're, we're, we will be painting a picture of the importance of school nurse, the changing nature of school nursing, highlight those two case studies about school districts that have some innovative programs of increasing access to school nurses. Um, and then finally, we want to give you an update or an overview of what our recommendations are looking like and how you guys can, how everyone here can help us make sure that our recommendations come to life. Uh, so before we get started, uh, I'm going to introduce Donna as our first speaker. I want to ask you guys a quick question. Um, we're going to ask you questions throughout this uh, presentation, uh, just partially because we really want to learn more about you and help inform what we're talking about, but also to, to keep you all awake a little bit. So the question today, right now, is if you're a school nurse, and most of you out there are, how many students do you serve? This is really in important to us, uh, particularly as we try to increase the access of school nursing to our students. While you guys vote, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Donna. Uh, Donna Donna has been a school nurse in community settings for most of her career. She has worked as a school nurse in high school and alternative school settings and led the health services team at the Maryland State, uh, State Department. Currently, she is executive director at the National Association of School Nurses. Her passion is to facilitate school nurse leadership so that students will experience optimum health and educational success. She is nationally certified in school nursing and counseling. We are also proud to say to call Donna a friend, and we are excited to have her with us. So now, as we look at our survey, it looks like we have a broad range of school of um, access in the, here we go, it looks like 14% have less than 250 students, 21% 250 to 750, that's great. 28% uh, 750 to 1500, 23% 1500 to 3000, and 14% more than 3000. Wow, as you can see, we definitely have a lot of work to do. Okay, thank you. So, uh, having said that, Donna, I'm giving you a virtual gavel, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here today. I want to speak to um, the care that school nurses deliver in schools. Uh, when they are there, and we see from the poll that they're not there every day. Uh, the National Association of School Nurses, NASN, was founded in 1968, and NASN exists to advance the specialty practice of school nursing to improve the health and academic success of students. In our next slide, we look at the availability of school nurses, and data from a 2007 survey show us that uh, Seventy-five percent of schools have either a full-time or a part-time registered nurse. But that 75 percent could actually speak to a nurse being in a school um, two hours a week, at least two hours a week. And the poll that, Mark, you just um, took of the listeners today demonstrates the vast disparities that there are in the availability of school nurses. And not every uh, parent is aware that they don't have a school nurse in their school. School nurse uh, positions are threatened by funding cuts every day, yet students continue to need care. In the next slide, we look at who are the employers of school nurses. And the vast majority of employers of school nurses are public schools. So education dollars are uh, used in order to provide the health services that children need in a school setting. Uh, public health departments are employers, hospitals, and there's a, a group, about 11% of others, uh, could be local hospitals, could be um, other private and, and public partnerships that bring school nurses into a school building. In the next slide, we talk about the increasing need for school nursing services. We all know firsthand, and certainly those who are listening today who are in schools, 
know that the, the duties that school nurses perform today go well beyond what school nursing was like uh, two decades ago, even 10, 15 years ago, when health care costs were a bit more affordable and school children with complex health needs didn't even come to the uh, comprehensive school building. Uh, we can see from the slides that an increase uh, by 60% of students in special education with health impairments due to chronic or acute health problems has occurred from 2002 to 2008. School nurses know that the students that they uh, take care of have a, a depth of complexity in their care like never before. And school nurses can deliver that care, but they need to have funded positions and they need to have the the uh, staffing levels that take into account the acuity levels of the students they see. Now some of what school nurses are doing in this next slide, the care coordination um, for children with chronic disease, with for um, first aid and injury care, for disaster preparedness, and for public health functions that school nurses perform, school nurses are delivering this care every time they're in a school building. And we really need to highlight that for health care because they're not aware, I don't think always, the depth of the care that happens in schools. There are also preventative services that school nurses are uh, involved in doing. And in the next slide, we see that immunizations, uh, making sure that students are compliant with those immuniz immunizations, speaking with parents, educating parents and guardians about what is needed to prevent uh, those vaccine preventable diseases in the school setting and what are the mandates required. Also, the health screenings that nurses bring um, into schools is important for the students so that they can be available for their learning. And of course, school nurses are always reaching out to the partners who are uh, helping students stay safe, healthy, and ready to learn. Now, the question is, specifically for this webinar, who is responsible for this funding? Our next slide demonstrates how school nurses are squarely in the middle of health and education. And I'm sure that every school nurse, as I was when I was in a high school setting, can uh, testify to the fact that you're pulled from uh, those two settings that we're part of. And reform is happening right now in both those systems. And who better than school nurses to continue the connection that we have in order, in between those two systems in order to affect changes that will benefit students every day. Uh, Julia Graham Lear has written about school health services as a hidden system of health care. And we are saying that it can't be hidden anymore because the health care that's happening, that school nurses are delivering, is making a difference for students. And school nurses ensure that continuity of care and greater coordination between health and education sectors. In the next slide, we look at some of the innovation in school nurse funding that is happening right now but needs to happen at a deeper and wider level. The Center for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation um, looks for ways in which uh, better health and lower costs can um, impact our health care delivery system. But there are barriers right now today to um, school nurse funding. And one of those barriers is a lack of the recognition by health insurers of the health services that are happening in schools. And that correspondingly, there is a lack of reimbursement for the health care that's occurring in schools. And we also have policies from the federal level all the way down um, to state and local level that prevent um, school nurse school health services being funded, and thereby school nurse positions being funded, and thereby students be having the care that they need in school to help them stay in school. Now, in our next slide, I want to just uh, draw a picture for you. When we talk about innovation in school nurse funding and we look at health care reimbursement, we understand that under that umbrella of health care reimbursement are all types of settings where healthcare services occur. And this um, umbrella is not exhaustive. What's under the umbrella is not, is not exhaustive. From acute care hospitals to home health care to health care or medical homes, rehab facilities, federally qualified health centers, school-based health centers, health care reimbursement does occur in one way or another. 
but look at where school nursing services are. Still part of healthcare delivery systems, but not protected under that umbrella. And so what, do, what needs to happen? Are there innovative programs and innovative policies that would enable in this next slide for us to see school nursing to come under the umbrella of health care reimbursement? Education dollars alone cannot support the health care that happens in schools. And so we are really looking at what needs to happen to move this innovation forward so that we can see school health services appropriately reimbursed for students who are in the school building. Children come to school, they don't put a pause on their chronic health problems, they don't put a pause on their acute health needs. They need to be able to have the services in that setting and those services need to be reimbursed. And so with that, I'd like to um, uh, just end this part so you can hear about some of those innovative uh, programs that are out there now. Great. Thank you so much, Donna. I mean, one of the things that's, I mean, just to, just to reiterate your point, what, what is so important is that right now school health services and education dollars are to compete for the same dollars. And when you're talking about getting class, teachers in the classroom and, and dollars into the, into the classroom, it's, 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 it's hard to compete. So we want to make sure that we have identified strategies to make sure we're getting health dollars into our schools. So our next speaker is Melissa Landau, but before we do, let me ask a quick um, poll question of you all. Uh, th this question is, what do you see as the biggest barrier to having a school nurse in every school? Take a moment while I'll introduce Melinda. Uh, Melissa, Melinda Landau is the manager of health and family support programs for San Jose School District in California. In this role, she provides leadership and coordination for all health programs and services in the district. She's also the grant coordinator for a multi-million dollar demonstration project called Putting Healthcare Back into Schools. Prior to joining San Jose School District, she worked as a school nurse for 10 years. Now let's look at the answers that we have and clearly um, what comes up is for, from this group is lack of funding is the biggest issue. And so let's at least hear what one school district um, from Melinda, what they did to identify additional funding. So. Melinda, the, uh, the, again, the virtual gavel, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do today is share some information about a project that we've been working on for the last four years. It's putting health care back into schools. It's a demonstration project funded by Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. So if we go to the first slide, the project overview, um, it is a five-year demonstration project. We put uh, a full-time school nurse at two elementary, two middle schools, and we formally linked them to the, the school nurse to the community-based FQHC school health clinic that was operating within our boundaries. Now, the FQHC was not part of San Jose Unified. They're their own separate entity. We also have a researcher from Stanford Medical School so this has become a quasi-experimental project. We started back in August of 2007, and we are scheduled to end this June. Next slide. So just a brief overview of San Jose Unified. We are a K-12 school district. We have 32,000 kids at 40 school sites. All of our demonstration schools are located near our downtown area. They're all Title I. Uh, they're um, pretty close to the school health clinic with two of the four schools within walking distance to the clinic. Uh, as you can see, we're highly Hispanic at 82%. 45% of our kids are English language learners at the demonstration schools, and 82% of our kids at the demonstration schools are free and reduced lunch. So the next slide. Okay, so um, when we're looking at, excuse me just a minute, the project goals. This was a, a really unique project. Um, the funders came to us and they said, we're really wondering if we could get health care back into the schools in the form of school nurses, what would happen? Um, and their hypothesis was that if we had school nurses in our demonstration schools, that we would have improved health care management 
Um, and those students with medical, chronic medical conditions would have better health outcomes. Uh, we looked at having the school nurse help facilitate establishment of a medical home for our students. And we wanted to use this project as a tool to work towards better school nurse to student ratios in public schools across California. The next slide, please. So why did we partner with Packard and the school health clinics? We really saw this as a huge opportunity to expand and measure the scope of services provided by our school nurses. We have an evaluator that, that helps us uh, develop the outcomes and um, measure how, how we are at re toward reaching those outcomes. We had hoped that we would see improved attendance and academic performance. We had really hoped that we would be creating lifelong health habits for those students with um, chronic diseases around their chronic disease management that would carry them beyond the, the school day into their regular life and into adulthood. Um, we partnered with Packard at looking at hopefully we'd be able to save costs in hospitalization and acute care. And just intuitively, we knew that it would work. So the next slide is on key findings. Um, and then we'll just go right into the, the following slide. So we are looking at um, this slide is a little complex, but what it is is we have discovered that we have an opportunity gap for kids with chronic health problems. So what we've found is through our project we have eliminated that opportunity gap on the CSTELA scores. CSTELA is the language portion of the California standardized testing. Um, when we look at 2007-2000, asthma. The red is any student who's been identified with a neurodevelopmental disorder. And our evaluator has uh, identified those kids as our Asperger's, Asperger kids, our autism kids, our seizure kids. The green is any student with a known chronic health problem that is neither asthma nor neurodevelopmental. And the purple are the kids with no known health problems. As you can see in 2007-2008, we had a statistically significant difference between the kids that had asthma who were proficient or advanced on the CSTELA and those that had no known health problem. The same held true for the other two areas as well. As we progress through the, through the project, when we get into year four, you can see that we've eliminated that gap, that essentially they are on the level playing field, the kids with asthma, the kids with any known health problem, and the kids with no known health problems. So we've leveled that playing field. The area that's still of concern are those neurodevelopmental kids. Now, we're looking at why those numbers have not gone up, but we suspect when you have a child with autism, you have a child with Asperger's, in our area at least traditionally, the nurses do not affect change in those areas. So we're still looking at why those numbers didn't go up. Next slide. We are looking at students in our um, demonstration school are twice as likely to visit a doctor after a medical referral. This slide shows our vision referrals and it helps you for both our scoliosis and our hearing referrals. So you would think that when a school nurse finds a potential vision problem and we offer uh, kids free exams and glasses if they don't have health insurance, that all the kids would go. But what we have found is that when we started the project, less than half of the kids actually went to see an eye doctor. So the first year of our project with the full-time nurses, we had about 69% of our kids um, who were referred to a vision specialist after finding a problem with their vision were actually seen. At our non-demonstration schools, it was down around 37%. Year four of the project, we're up around 100% of our kids. If if they have a vision problem identified by a school nurse, they are evaluated by a vision specialist. We've improved how we do this, um, the process is in place, and we've been able to uh, put that district-wide, so 58% of our kids in our district um, who are evaluated uh, are actually seen by a healthcare provider. The next slide is around student asthma. 
We have found that student asthma is better controlled than now than when we started the project. Looking at this slide, we, we asked parents, how many times in the past year has your child been seen in the ER for asthma? Back in 0809, 45% of the parents said that their child had not been in the ER for asthma that year. That means that 55% of the kids with asthma had been in the ER that year. We uh, moved forward to the 2010-2011 last spring when we asked parents, and we found that 83% of our kids had not been in the ER. So only 17% of our kids had been seen in the ER for asthma. What has happened is we, the school nurses have been working with these kids. Um, we have referred them to primary care physicians and we're getting their asthma under better control so they don't need to go to the ER as frequently. You can imagine the cost savings and we're looking at societal cost savings on this slide alone and our Stanford evaluator is uh, actually putting together um, the cost benefit savings locally just based on this data that they've collected and we should have that data available when we present at the National School Nurse Conference in June. The next slide, um, access to health care. In San Jose Unified, we have a culture, we have a belief that every student should have access to quality, comprehensive health care, and we've put some resources towards that. We still have a Health to Start program, and we have certified application assisters who um, work in that program and get kids signed up for the Medicaid Healthy Families, um, the SCHIP program, uh, and local Healthy Kids and the Kaiser uh, program for low-cost uh, health insurance. The key in this slide is if we look at the none column, which is the fourth over, and when we did the original survey back in um, 08, 09, we saw that about 10% of our kids did not have health insurance. We've reduced that as last spring down to 4.2%. So we have made significant gains in making sure that every child has access to health care. The next slide is about absenteeism. Um, we looked at the absentee, uh, the number of absent days due to illness. So when we looked at the 06-07 compared it to the 08-09 school year, um, we found a statistically significant difference of 0.22 days per student um, in absences due to illness between our demonstration schools and our uh, comparison schools. Now this doesn't sound like a lot, but when you take it over the four schools and over the year, it actually saved our district about $48,000 in ADA funding, and it meant those kids were in the classroom available to be taught. Um, the next slide, we are expanding our demonstration project, parts of it, the full-time nurse, because we started getting some really good results out of this, um, at year three, we were able to have one of our other schools come on board where they have a full-time nurse, and they're backfilling the district allocation for nursing with Title I money so that they, too, have a full-time nurse. And while they don't have the grant evaluator that we have in the project, they are looking at the educational outcomes of the kids, and we're finding very similar educational outcomes for the kids at this um, uh, other school that's using Title I money. So approximately 50% of all the kids with asthma targeted with intervention by the school nurse have significant gains in either their math or language uh, CST, which is the state testing score. The kids who made gains in um, the language portion had an average of 70 point increase, and the students that made gains in the math had 45 points per student increase. We have expanded this now into two more school sites. We um, are using a coordinated school health approach, so we now have seven schools with full-time nurses. We are collecting data out of the um, coordinated school health, so we'll have some more data on that into the next year. Those coordinated school health nurses are funded by taking pieces from the other uh, 33 schools 
a piece of their school nurse time so that we can make a whole school nurse at these two sites. Next slide. So some of the key findings, and um, uh, not only do we have these academic and uh, findings from our evaluator, but what we've also found is that we are more closely linked to our communities. We're bringing in free services to our students. Um, just with our school health clinics alone, we did 144 health classes or events um, just last year. Uh, we partnered with Public Health two years ago when we had the H1N1. Because we've had these full-time nurses, we were able to do um, H1N1 vaccinations to offer them to all of our students. Um, we gave over 16,000 doses of H1N1. Uh, we've been partnering with the, some local dental uh, societies and uh, uh, dental groups so that we can get free dental care for our kids. We've partnered with Stanford Medical School and the Children's Hospital to bring resident physicians in to do some health education, the Diabetes Society with the City of San Jose. So the partnerships have become very, very rich as part of this project. Um, the final slide is um, actually it was intended to be a link to a video. We have our parents and our nurses talking about the projects and, and the changes that it has made in the lives of the children um, and the stories that they told. And that link will be shared later, um, and it will be up on the website uh, after the presentations. Great. So that's it. Thank you so much, Melinda. Um, the, the link, when we um, send out an email, we will have the slides archived uh, along with the presentations that you can download, and we will make sure to include a link to your video. Um, and, I, you know, we have questions at the end, but we had a couple of questions that I think you can answer very qu quickly, Melinda. But what are the ratios of school nurses to students in your demonstration schools? Um, at the elementary sites, they're 1 to about 550. And at the middle school sites, they're 1 to 1,100. Great. Thank you so much. Now, our next, before we get to our next speaker, Denise Baldwin, I am going to ask um, another question. Um, we're going to ask the poll. Of, Does your school district bill Medicaid services delivered in your schools? We'd love to hear. Um, so in the meantime, Denise is our next speaker. So Denise Baldwin has been the director of nursing for Hopkins County School District in Kentucky. For the past 12 years, she oversees 14 satellite clinics in all public schools located in Hopkins County. She worked in, uh, as a pediatric nurse for 14 years prior to joining Hopkins County and is an active member of the Kentucky Public Health Association and the Kentucky School Nurse Association. So let's just see our answer to our survey. And it looks like about half of everyone who is on this list, they um, are, are billing Medicaid services for IEP students. 30% uh, say no, 12% are providing students for Medicaid eligible and CHIPS eligible students. So I think that's interesting. And we are going to now hear from one school district or one area that is providing, um, uh, is billing Medicaid for um, services rendered in schools. So Denise, look forward to um, hearing your presentation. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm actually the Director of Nursing for Hopkins County Health Department, not the school district. We are a public health school district program, school program. So, uh, I apologize, Denise. Thank you. That's okay. Uh-huh. Um, next slide. Okay. We are a single county health department, and we serve 14 schools. We have two school districts in those, um, out of those 14 schools. One district has 13 schools, and one district is a K through 12 school program, and it's an independent district. Our actual school health program began with a grant in 1989 in Dawson Springs, Kentucky. It's the most rural city in Hopkins County. It's about 30 miles away from Madisonville where we have a large medical campus. So there's really only one physician practice in Dawson. Um, this grant was a rural health grant based on Medicaid rates in the community. Our Medicaid rates run about 40 to 50 percent. Some schools are way higher and some lower. But that's average, and that's the way our school program works. Um, the goals, next. 
Um, the goals, why is a public health department in, in the schools? Why are we involved? And we, we try to do the basic 2020 objectives with our school health program. So ours is a little more focused on public health being in the schools than just typical school health uh, with the outcomes and things like that. We try to increase the immunization rates in our county, increase attendance rates and decrease truancy, decrease teen pregnancy rates, increase preventive physicals and services, promote early referrals and prevention of complications. That a lot of times when the school nurse refers a, a child to the physician, it actually, um, we have a higher ratio of getting that student into the physician and not having to go to the emergency room that night. We decrease tobacco use amongst teens. We do a lot of education and promotion, promote early prenatal care for teens. We actually do pregnancy testing in our schools, which I understand is pretty unique. But we've been around for about 20 years plus, and so we have a lot of trust in our community. We try to decrease unnecessary emergency room visits, which, as you know, is very expensive for everybody. And we promote dental health. Next. Um, our basic mission is to provide public health services to our schools via the school clinics. And in the same uh, way, we also provide needed health services to our local school system. Next slide. Our demographics, we're a large rural county with about 50,000 50, residents. We're pretty spread out. Um, we have about 7,500 school children total in our school districts. Next slide, please. Um, what we try to do in our public health department, and different school health programs work differently, including school health programs that are public health department programs. So ours is kind of unique. Um, we actually have satellite health departments in the school system with, by contract with the school system. So these are not school clinics. They're actually health department clinics, and by contract we're allowed to be there. So they're run by the health department. We provide vaccine for children immunizations in the school clinic, and some health department purchase vaccines in the schools. Last year, we gave almost 3,000 vaccines in the school system. We also do EPSDT physicals, which are Medicaid well child physicals in the schools. And we are the highest single county percent per population provider of EPSDT physicals in the state of Kentucky. Last year, we did almost 2,000 EPSDT physicals in the school. And the reason this is so important is because we're finding problems early. We're referring. We're getting children to the needed care. We also did 76 pregnancy tests in the school system last year which we assist with referring for early prenatal care. And of course, there are the negative pregnancy tests, which then we try to refer and work with them on preventing pregnancy. Why is this so important? Um, you know, I've told people, as director of nursing at the health department, school health is actually not even listed on my job description, but I spend about 50% of my time doing school health. And I'm very passionate about school health because I believe it's providing access. We are out there in the schools. We're out there where the children are, and they're, they're being provided health care. And a lot of these children are not taken in to the medical community for health care. The school nurses saw 33,000-plus visits last school year in our school health clinics, and they saw 6,626 unduplicated patients. So we're reaching 88% of the school population. What health care uh, practice can say that they're doing that? So. That's why we're so important that we're in the schools, we're providing the, the school health, but we're also getting that child into the medical community. We um, do not do daily meds and don't count those in our numbers, so this is strictly uh, either physical immunizations or sick child visits. We actually train, delegate, and supervise the daily meds um, by the school staff. Our ratio of nurse to student is 1 to 535, so we feel like our program's working. By doing this program this way, we're actually meeting the national standards, and I think most standards say that it's 1 to 750 school nurses uh, student to uh, school nurse ratio is optimal. So we're actually exceeding that right now. What do our school nurses do? Um, basically the same thing that uh, any school nurse does with a little bit of a public health slant to that. We do treat the emergencies. We assess and treat the sick children. We work with the children with asthma to decrease absences and, and to increase compliance. 
we do vision scoliosis screening, um, both individual and mass screenings. We do a lot of immunizations. We audit records to uh, assure compliance with state regulations. And we do a lot of school physicals. We do school entry and sixth grade physicals. In some schools, especially our high Medicaid schools, we do about 95% of the school physicals that are done in those schools. And the way we're able to do that is we are on all RN-based school clinics, and the RNs are EPSDT-trained public health nurses, so we're certified to actually do the school physicals and to sign them. We do well-child physicals for those children with Medicaid, and we also write care plans for children with special needs, and we're a liaison with the physician community. We train staff to do medical procedures for students with special needs, and we supervise and follow up with those children. And we also see those children if there's an emergency or a need during the school day. Uh, we review and sign paperwork for homebound students, and that's to try to make sure that students who are on homebound are incorporated back into the school community as soon as possible. We do headlights for headlights checks for questionable cases, and I know we in public health say headlights is not a public health problem, but as you know in school health, it's a big problem. So it seems like we're always working with headlights. We do health education classes as requested by teachers, hand washing, any kind of, of class that they like on health. And we do human growth and development from fifth through ninth grade. We've been doing this a long time. And when I went to the recent meeting of, of Healthy Schools, I found that a lot of people wanted to know about this because they've had trouble getting into their schools to do this. And I think that goes with having a public health department nurse in there for 20 years in some of the schools and, and building the trust. Because in fifth grade, we do hygiene talks and basic anatomy. But in sixth through ninth, we actually talk about abstinence, birth control, anatomy and physiology, pregnancy, HIV and AIDS. And it is a pretty um, strong course. And so, and we really don't, we rarely ever get a complaint. Children do have to have a parental consent to sit in. And we uh, very rarely ever get a parent that holds their child out of that. And I think that's from being in the school so long. So hopefully we're um, providing children some needed education on human growth and development. We uh, work with diabetic children on insulin carb counting and we also provide EPS and KCHIP outreach in the school system. Next slide, please. Quality. Um, one of the things that we try to do is to make sure that we're providing the same equipment and protocols that are used at the health department in our school clinic. If somebody went into this school clinic, they should ha see the same setup and same availability for that RN as we have here. We have pulse oximeters in all the schools. We have um, new and good equipment in all the schools. And we actually have a chart and actually bill right there on the computer in the school system. So when you walk into our school clinic, you feel like you're in a mini health department. Um, we do not provide family planning in the schools other than uh, pregnancy testing and referral. I have been asked that. We follow. HIPAA and FARPA guidelines per our contract with the school and our consent clearly states to the parent what um, hit that they are covered under HIPAA for their child unless there is something that the school has a need to know such as immunizations and um, school physicals and things like that. For instance, if a child comes in for a pregnancy test, we may address the school if the school needs to know, did they really come to the clinic and how long they were there. We'll allow them to know that. But we would not give the information of what they came there for because that's covered under HIPAA. And that's really important to outline in your school contract what you will share. Each school is audited twice per year internally. And we have been randomly audited by the State Department for Public Health Quality Improvement Team. There's a change in that right now, so I'm not sure how that's going to be done in the future. Our school nurses, next slide, please. Next, please. Thank you. Um, our school nurses are all registered nurses. They're all public health department nurses. I try to maintain about a 70% BSN or higher ratio because of having the community uh, classes that they have in the BSN program. We have about an average experience of about 18 years. I also think that's really important because this nurse is going to be working independently. And we train them about four to six weeks before they go out on their own. 
we uh, hire all part-time, non-benefited employees. So you have to have employees that have a real love for school health, and I have a very low turnover rate. So these are people that really want to be doing this. They work six hours per day, school days, and training days only, and so that's about 185 days per year. Next. And that does help keep our costs down. Funding. Um, funding is always a big question. How are we doing this? Um, right now, the way we work is that the Department for Public Health, they have an agreement with Medicaid that we can provide preventive services. School health is considered a preventive service, and so we are allowed to bill Medicaid. Uh, Kentucky is also a Title V, has Title V funding for this program, and so we are exempt from the Medicaid Free Care Act. So we provide health care to all children while billing Medicaid only. We um, bill fee-for-service for school health through the preventive program, so we do um, a charge ticket, so to speak, with EM billing, and then any um, individualized care like hearing testing, vision testing, are billed through that program. We do not bill mass screenings like vision and hearing that we do for the groups, and we do not bill anything that is part of a student's IEP plan because the school districts can bill for these, and we don't want to be double dipping into that. So if it's a, something that is specifically outlined on their IEP plan, we do not bill for it, or if it's a mass screening. But if it's an individual sick child or special needs, child or any kind of immunizations and physicals that we do, we can bill Medicaid for these. Our school system does uh, chip into this program. They pay a certain amount for each school, and our local health department does supplement this with uh, local health department dollars so that non-Medicaid children may also receive care. In order to do this kind of of a school health clinic using public health, you would have to have Title V, and there's been some discussion on that at, at the Healthy Schools meeting about the Free Care Act, and you would also have to have a high Medicaid eligible population for this program to work. Next slide, please. Um, some of our challenges, we, we feel like we have just an awesome program right now, and we're very proud of it, but some of the challenges is, that are affecting us right now, and I'm sure they're affecting everybody else, is that we're facing millions of dollars of tax of cuts in uh, program dollars. And the Department for Public Health has started requiring health departments to pay the 30% Medicaid match themselves, and that's really been hard on the health departments trying to continue school health. Also, Kentucky has went to a three MCO system. This started in November, but luckily our governor signed a carve out so that public health preventive services, which in school, includes school health, have to be paid and be part of the MCO system. So we have just started with that um, in November. The Department of Public Health is recommending because of, of cuts, programmatic cuts, that public health departments consider cutting services that are not core public health services, and unfortunately, school health is not considered a core service. However, because we do so many public health services in the schools, our health department and our board of health is very committed to keeping the school nurses in the schools. Some of the outcomes, and I loved our last speaker and her great outcome data, but I tried to focus more on, on the public health since that's what's unique about us. We have improved attendance, which helps the schools a lot and keeps children in so that they can receive education and health care. Our immunization rates and audits have drastically improved. Our EPS rates went up by 2,000 physicals per year. We have partnered with the University of Kentucky to provide varnish and sealants in the schools. And what we do is we give them a dental suite here to work out of, out of our health department, and then they're able to go out and provide varnish and sealants, and they can do treatments in our dental clinic if a child has a need. Um, the reason we're so interested in this is Kentucky is number one in toothlessness in the United States, not something we're overly proud of, but something that we need to work on. We also gave 390 HPV vaccines in the schools last year, and Kentucky is really high in the nation in cervical cancer rates. So we're trying to get out there and, and get the HPV vaccines done because a lot of times parents both work, or if the child's not sick, it's really hard for them to transport the child in for a series of three injections. And so we find that by doing these in the school, we send the VIS and the consent home, 
then we're able to actually reach you know, 390 children in one school year. And so we're, we're making progress toward decreasing our cervical cancer rates. Um, next slide, please. Our superintendents um, are really committed to helping us stay in the school system. And Alexis Seymour, our Dawson Springs School District uh, superintendent, says school health is often the only health care my students receive. And a lot of people don't realize that. There may be, we have a really nice medical community, a large hospital and large outpatient, two large outpatient practices here in Madisonville. But if students don't get taken in for health care, they don't receive health care. Uh, James Lee Stevens, our Hopkins County School District, he said that school health clinics are a safety net reaching those who are most at risk in their own environments. And that's what we're trying to do. I always say they're a captive audience, and that's why public health needs to be in school health so that we can actually reach those children where they are every day. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Denise, for, um, for your presentation. Uh, uh, Ed, we're, we're glad that you were able to share, and we look forward to you sticking around to answer some questions. Now I'd like to uh, introduce Alex Scheibel, our pro policy analyst here at Healthy Schools Campaign, who's going to talk about our health in mind um, recommendations and how you all can get involved. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so thank you to our other three speakers. I think they did a wonderful job painting the picture of how important school nurses are to the health sector and making sure that children have access to health services that they need. At Healthy Schools Campaign, as Mark mentioned, we've been working on the issue of school nurses for a while. And for the first time, we really feel like this is an important opportunity um, to work on this issue of trying to increase resources for school nurses and make sure that students do have access to a school nurse when they're in school every day. Um, the nation has had a shift in focus from treating diseases to one on prevention and health promotion. In 2010, we had the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which included a lot of provisions around prevention and health promotion. And as a part of the Affordable Care Act, the nation released their first national prevention strategy, which is a really exciting thing in that it brings together 17 federal agencies to collaborate on the issue of prevention and health promotion. And schools are recognized as an important piece of that strategy, um, and we feel like it's an important opportunity to acknowledge the role that school nurses can play in prevention and health promotion. And as Mark mentioned, on May 9th, we'll have the opportunity to present recommendations to Secretary Duncan and Secretary Sebelius, and included in those recommendations will be how we can increase resources for school nurses. And so in order to develop our recommendations for what we wanted to present to the secretaries, back in February, we held a convening with a group of over 50 stakeholders to talk about this exact issue, um, thinking about what are the barriers to increased resources for school nurses. Donna, in her presentation, mentioned a number of them, and we really wanted to dig into those and figure out what were barriers that could be addressed and how did we want to go about addressing those. And what emerged from our conversation was that one of the primary barriers is um, the free care rule. And Denise mentioned it a little bit in her presentation. But what the free care rule is, is it says that Medicaid funds cannot be used to pay for services that are free to everybody in a community. And why this is particularly important to schools is that the services that school nurses are providing serve the entire school community. And so as a result, the majority of school districts aren't able to bill for the services that school nurses are providing to the general student population. And there are a few exceptions. As you heard from Denise, her school district has Title V funding, and that means that this rule doesn't apply. So it's interesting to think about the program that she set up there and that they are able to bill Medicaid for a lot of the services that they're providing. And we really feel this is especially relevant for school nurses that are serving populations that have really high percentages of Medicaid students. And the free care rule has actually been the subject of dispute um, over the last decade, which is also interesting. A number of states and school districts have challenged it, um, challenging the fact that our, it, does this really apply to schools? Um, and in 2004, the Department of Health and Serv Human Services actually ruled for the state of Oklahoma that it does not apply to schools. Um, but 
um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid, which is the federal agency that administers public health insurance programs, including Medicaid, has continued to go on enforcing this rule. And so out of this meeting, this really emerged as a primary barrier. And so we wanted to look at how we could issue recommendations for the secretaries about how we could address it. Um, and we felt that it was very important um, to declare that school health services are exempt from free, the free care rule. Um, as I mentioned, the, with the Health and Human Services ruling, there is a basis for this. And we felt that it's a reasonable thing to ask um, for clarification on that. And also, even with the school, even with um, if the free care rule um, was ruled to not apply to school health services, we feel that there's a need for guidance to states, um, encouraging them to bill for the services that school nurses are providing and acknowledging that really critical role that school nurses play in delivering health services to students. Um, and finally, we feel like, um, and Donna mentioned it in her presentation as well, that there's a strong need for the health and education sector to collaborate on these issues and for the education sector to acknowledge that healthy students are better learners, and for the health sector to acknowledge um, that school nurses and school health services really can be an integral component of the health, of health services for children. So we'll be presenting these recommendations to the secretaries on May 9th. Um, we would love your support of this work. There's more information about our recommendations and background on them on our website at healthyschoolscampaign.org um, slash health and mind. We also have a vision statement around this effort, um, just stating that we want the education sector to acknowledge the important role that health can play in supporting academic achievement. And we welcome you as individuals to sign on to this vision statement, to get your school districts to sign on to the statement, to contact your state school nurse associations, to contact your local education agencies. Um, we want to show support for this initiative so that when we present that report to the secretaries, um, we can demonstrate that there are um, organizations and individuals behind this. Um, and finally, we encourage you to stay involved in this effort. Um, the link, um, Healthy Schools Campaign slash School Nurse, um, has ongoing information about this and is a great way to stay in touch with what we're doing as we move forward. Great. Thank you so, so much, Alex. And um, it looks like it, we have hit the, uh, just about hit the hour mark. So. I, before we go on, we do have a handful of questions, and I would love to try to stick around a little bit longer. So I want to ask a quick question of everyone. So here's a quick poll. Are you able to stick around for a few minutes with us? We promise not to go over too long. Um, if you're able to stay a few minutes with us, we will then like to take the time to answer some questions. Um, if you have to run, we completely understand. So give us, I'll give you five more seconds to vote. One, two. Three, four, five, and it looks like uh, it looks like most people are say they can stick around. So let's say let's try to stick around for ten more minutes if you have to run. I'm sorry, it will be archived and you will be able to get this on our website. In the meantime, let's take just five or ten more minutes to get through a few questions. If you still have questions, you can still type them into the chat box um, or into the question box, and we will do our best to get to them. Uh, the first question that I am going to ask, um, I believe this uh, was this was this um, directed to Melinda, but it would work for De Melinda or Denise or, or even Donna. Um, is there a district level nurse coordinator in your schools, and how do you feel about this as a central tenant in helping solve the problem of increasing schools uh, school nursing access? So I'll start by saying, Melinda, um, is there a district level nurse coordinator? Um, in your in your school? Yes, I am the district level nurse coordinator and it was because we had this position that we actually got pa the Packard grant. They were looking at several schools and the decide school districts and the deciding factor was that we had a nurse coordinator position. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and Denise, would you like to respond to uh, the question? Yes, I am the nurse coordinator for school health in our county. I work a lot with the uh, DPP in our school district and the principals and uh, I spend about 50 percent of my time as director of, of public health nursing doing school health and we also have somebody that supervises the clerical end so they have quite a bit of support. 
Okay, great. Um, all right, so let me uh, continue. I believe this one will be directed to Melinda. Um, are there workers that assisted in enrolling families in FCHIP on site at the schools? We, we have two um, application assisters, and we have one at the district office and one out by the school health clinic um, that are there all the time and can, will take phone calls and appointments. If a school wants, we will come out and do a, a, an event or have the person out at the school site at a scheduled time. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right, question for Denise. What percentage of school clinic operations funding comes from billing? I, I'm not uh, sure if that was re referring to Medicaid billing, but I assume it is. Um, I'm trying to think of an actual percentage. I know the numbers, but um, our school district does, does uh, give us about $8,000 per school. And then we do, I would say, over half of our school um, funding does come from Medicaid. So I would say at least 50%. 50%. Okay, wonderful. Um, let me, okay, so here's another question focused to Denise. Um, billing paperwork, is it done by the nurse or administration, and how do you account for funds received? Okay, we have a clerk that actually works in each of our schools, and that is paid for by the school district. And they actually, we have computers set up, and as we see a child, they bill immediately, just like if the patient was being seen in the health department, they have the link um, to our billing system. Our CDP is our billing system, and they bill it as the service is being rendered. Okay, thank you. Um, Melinda, how much education and training was provided on strategic planning and collaboration before you hired and placed nurses um, in your schools? Is that a, a, overall? Um, in, in overall, in California, we are required to have um, BSN prepared nurses, and then after they are hired, they have five years to go and get what. It is about another 30 to 40 postgraduate units. So our nursing force is highly educated. Um, the training is woefully poor. Um, we do tend to give them a little bit and then say go on your way. The nice thing about having the goals and objectives based on the Packard project is that there's much clearer um, guidelines on how to do the work. Uh, and, and we did start the project. We had two brand new nurses, nurses who were new to school nursing. Uh, they had some home health experience and then two experienced school nurses. So we were kind of looking at that too as far as outcomes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Denise, I have to ask, there, there are a couple of responses um, to your comment on the school nurses being part-time and not receiving benefits. Yes. Um, is, would you, so there are some questions about concern um, over that position, and would you want to comment or respond on, to that? Sure. Um, when we advertise, we're very clear about what we're advertising for, and I tend to get people that either they want to only have this part-time job because they have small children, or honestly because they can afford to do it, um, or they, um, you know, or I've got somebody that she's closer to retirement. She has a, a BSN MBA, but she's wanting to work a few more years, but, but wanted to do something like this that she feels like she's giving back quite a bit. So luckily we do have um, Murray State University and a community college that both supply RNs here in town. So we, we have a good, good pick when I advertise. But I, I'm very upfront with what I'm advertising, and I've never had any problems finding somebody that was interested in the position. Okay. Um, the, the, the questions keep rolling in, so I'm right now working on um, keeping up. Uh, first of all, uh, will the PowerPoints be available? Absolutely will be available. Next, Melinda, publishing your results of your study. Um, yeah, we've, we've published um, through Emerald 
publishing. We've um, had our first publication out. Um, we are in the final um, revising stage of putting one in the journal of school nursing. Uh, and then as it progresses and as we get year five, we'll have additional publications out. Um, it, uh, our evaluator is into publication, so we'll have several coming out. Okay, wonderful. And, and we'll, be, we'll be happy to help distribute that information. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Let me, I am going to keep going through our questions. Um, so da, 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 extra. Um, wow, we've got a great group. All right. Um, Denise, uh, Kentucky nurses, do they write, do the nurses in Kentucky write IEPs? Do they attend 504 meetings? And do they delegate and supervise care to lay staff? Okay, um, let me try to answer that. Uh, yes, when we have a lay staff that is being trained to provide the general things, CAS, suctioning, um, the RN will train. We have usually two to three uh, lay staff trained for each each student. We train, delegate, and supervise that. Um, and what was the rest? Uh, supervise. Um IEPs delegate in uh, okay. delegate to LASA. The uh, special education department actually writes the IEPs. We do sit in on IEP planning and 504 planning uh, as requested. Okay, great. Um, Melinda, what strategies are used to achieve high levels of parents who take their children to a vision specialist? Um, part of the strategy is just having them know the nurse. The nurse is there full time. The nurse is seen as a trusted uh, member of the school staff where when they would come and go and they'd be there one to two days a week, that was very different. Um, the nurses have come up with some kind of creative um, ideas. One of my favorites is um, they put a stamp that says second notice, so it kind of looks like a bill. On, on some of these when it's the second time that they've had to send a, a, a notice. And oddly enough, that seems to um, really get some parents to move on it. Um, a lot of it's frequent phone calls, having the, the teacher make calls, having the health clerks make calls, having the uh, principals at time make calls. Um, it's standing out when the kids are leaving and snagging the parents when they're coming to pick up their kids. It is a challenging uh, process, and it takes three to five interventions before they'll get success very often. Okay. Um, let me see. I'm going to ask this question to uh, Alex. I'm at a charter school in Southern California, and we cannot bill Medicaid. Um, any way we can fight to change this? <laughs> um, good question. I mean, I mean, it definitely, depending on what the reason is that you're not able to bill Medicaid, um, I mean, I would encourage you um, to ta determine what the reason is that you're not able to bill Medicaid, and then if it is because of this free care rule issue, um, to engage with us on it and um, to, we're, as we're working to build support to try to change this, um, we feel that it's a really important opportunity. I know in California there are a number of districts that have challenged it, um, San Francisco has, and um, so perhaps reaching out to um, your state, your California Association of State School Nurses um, and identifying other districts that have worked within the legal framework of California on this issue. Uh, for Melinda or Denise, um, students that have been referred for vision issues, uh, were they evaluated and given glasses in the school setting? Um, Who would like to jump on that? From, from uh, our project, it was only through the Essilor Foundation that came and they actually um, did the, some, the screenings and also put on the glasses. Um, that's the only time that they actually do it in the school setting. We go through the VSP vouchers that are available through NASN and most of our local optometrists take those vouchers. So if they don't have insurance, that's, we send them out usually. Okay, any other comments on that one? Okay, um, 
educated us. Uh, so, so question for Melinda or Denise. Um, do staff receive education assistance for extra hours of training in the school? Staff receive education. Um, this Denise, I, I don't, I don't mind to answer that. We, I, my, I'm very lucky. My director is very supportive, and so my staff uh, are able to attend the Kentucky School Nurse Association meeting every year to receive their CEUs, and we do. Um, we are able to go to several trainings, including EPSDT updates, and they are paid for by the health department. So that's a perk, even though we are non-benefited. Okay. And right. and ours, we oddly we use our the limited LEA medic medical which is Medicaid funding um, that we get. The the nurses get um, three hundred dollars a year for conferences, paid for out of that. But that's it. Okay. Um, I'm, you know, th there are so many questions coming in. I'm trying to keep up. I think that we're going to only be able to take two or three more, and we're going to have to wrap up. But let me start here. Um, this, I, I believe, is for uh, Melinda. What are the school relationships or the, the school's relationships with community health clinics for referring children for care, and was this established before the study began? Um, there was no relationship established before the study began, even though we had two school health clinics on site. Part of what we've done in the study is that we've developed a process when any student from one of our demonstration schools comes to the school health clinic, they automatically um, sign an exchange of information, and then the nurse practitioner at the school health clinic meets regularly with our school nurses, and they talk about um, the, the students care from both the school side and from the clinic side, which has been absolutely huge. Um, it, it, it has been uh, very powerful with the kids with asthma, and it, it's been great. Okay, great. Um, Donna, I, I'm sorry we haven't been asking you questions, but let me throw one to you. Donna, um, school nurses are an extension of the medical home of a child and, and prevent unnecessary ER visits. How do we get pediatricians better to communicate student health information with us as in school nurses and not hide behind HIPAA regulations? I think that's an, an issue of uh, relationship from the local level and also from the national level. I think that um, NASN does have a, a relationship with the American Academy Academy of Pediatrics Council on School Health, and that's a, a, an issue that I will bring forward. And also um, being able to, to really rally around the core goal of making sure the students are health, healthy and safe. And I think it, it is a, a relationship building uh, concern, and it takes time, but I believe from the school nurse level to the district level, I think it's important to build that. I also want to take this moment to say that I believe that district level nurse coordinator positions are absolutely essential and they lead school health programs and they help with district level policy making. And um, NASN will have a school nurse administrator book that will be um, unveiled later this year. Great, thanks Donna. I just wanted to jump in and say um, and we, having a district coordinator is, um, is wonderful. And then also as a part of our recommendations, but one that we didn't mention is we're recommending that within Department of Education that there is the federal level that there is somebody for school nurses um, and state school nurse consultants to reach out to. We feel that that's important too, just to have that presence in the federal administration. And because it's now 14 minutes after, I'm going to ask one more question, and this is also going to be for Alex. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up. But the free care rule, can you give me the more information about how I can find more information about this law? Great question. <laughs> um, I, we will be sure to send out more resources on it when we um, send our follow-up email to this. I, if you just search it online, there are a number of resources out there. Um, through our research, we found some very specific ones. I would recommend um, going on to our website and to the Health in Mind section of our website. And the back, we have a section on school nursing, and there's a background paper there that includes much more information about the free care role, including resources um, and references where you can learn even more. So there's a wealth of information on this. There's a lot of people that are working on it. Um, 
So we would encourage you to seek out that information. And we will try to highlight some of those links specifically when we archive this website, or this, 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 um, this presentation uh, in the next day or so. And just so you all know, you will all receive an email with the link for this archive presentation with the slides and with some relevant links for more information. Um, I, I have so many more questions. If, if we can go for it, we could easily go for another 15 minutes continuing to address questions. But uh, out of respect for everyone's time, the speakers, and for yours, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. And we are going to wrap up. Uh, we will do our best to answer the questions that haven't been answered live. Um, and uh, if you are able to or you're interested in, we hope you'll join us on our next webinars, both on school food, um, innovation around healthy school food, or the small business side. Or if you can't make it, please share and let your friends know um, and your colleagues know. Thank you again so much. We look forward to uh, continuing the uh, engagement and dialogue around these issues. And uh, until next time, we appreciate your, your, your time here. Thank you so much. I, I